Good morning, Edgewater Alliance Church. My name is Connor, and this morning I have the privilege of taking us through the second lesson in our series, Embracing Adventurous Faith. I remember being at Youth Pastor Summit in Orlando and hearing the speaker, Megan Fate Marshman, say these words, the leader is never the exception. The leader is never the exception. And obviously part of what is meant by those words is, is simply that the leader should do what he or she tells others to do. So if, if I'm going to stand on a platform and encourage people to embrace adventurous faith, I should be trying to do that in my life. If I am going around and saying that such and such political figure is ruining or could ruin our city, our state, or our country, well, I should probably vote. If I get paid to yell at people at the gym while they're lifting weights to push harder, I should probably have a lot of muscles, right? You and I want to follow people who not only know what to do, but who are actually doing what they know is right. And I submit to you that this is part of what we get when we choose to follow Jesus. The call to follow Jesus is not merely to believe in him, but also to go where he is gone. Jesus doesn't merely say, do this or go there. His continual call to us is follow me. I want to show you a, a list in the scriptures, and you're going to notice a theme. Matthew 4, 19, Jesus called out to them, come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. Matthew 8, 22, but Jesus told him, follow me now. Let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. Matthew 9, 9, as Jesus was walking along, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Matthew got up and followed him. Matthew 10, 38, if you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you're not worthy of being mine. Matthew 16, 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross and Matthew 19, 21, Jesus told him, if you want to be perfect, go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, you're getting it. Mark 1, 17, Jesus called out to them, come and I will show you how to fish for people. Mark 2, 14, as he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at his tax collector's booth. He, and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Levi got up and followed him. Mark 8, 34, then calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and... Mark 10, 21, looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. There is still no one that you, that, sorry, there is still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, Luke 9, 23. Then he said to the crowd, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross daily and, Luke 9, 59, he said to another person, come, the man agreed, but he said, Lord, first let me return home and bury my father. Last one. Let's make it count. Luke 14, 27. And if you do not carry your own cross and you cannot be my disciple. Edgewater Alliance Church. Do you think Jesus is interested in people following him? He is. The question for us becomes, what does it mean to follow Jesus? What is a follower? And I would submit to you that a follower is not only someone who increasingly understands what Jesus taught, but who also increasingly does what Jesus did. So think apprentice instead of student. A student learns what the teacher knows. An apprentice not only knows what the teacher knows, but does what the teacher does. And so uh, we, if we're going to follow Jesus, we need to not only understand what he taught, but we need to understand how he lived. So how did Jesus live? 
Well, he lived a life of humbly embracing adventurous faith. In Philippians chapter 2, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul writes these words. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. In this season, as a church, we are looking at this idea of embracing adventurous faith. And one thing I want you to see, I think it's going to be up on the screen for you, is that Jesus does not merely call us to embrace adventurous faith. He shows us what it looks like. He gives us an example to follow. And I like this idea that God doesn't call us to do things that he is not willing to do himself. Think about that for a moment. God does not call us to do things that he is not willing to do himself. Our leader, King Jesus, is not the exception. He is the example. He doesn't invite you on adventures that he isn't willing to go on. He doesn't tell you to embrace adventurous faith when he himself is not willing to embrace adventurous faith. In fact, I would submit to you, there is no one who has ever embraced adventurous faith like Jesus did, right? Think about the incarnation for a moment. The incarnation means taking on flesh. When Jesus was in heaven, in perfect Trinitarian relationship, leaves heaven, comes to a world under the curse of sin, this would not be an upgrade from his pre-incarnate position, okay? He comes here. And I want you to think of this really as the start to the biggest mission trip of all time. Jesus leaves heaven, takes on flesh, comes to a planet under the curse of sin, and has marching orders to really save humanity from the curse of sin, which results in eternal death. So that was the adventure that Jesus took when he came from heaven to earth. And that was just the beginning. Born in Bethlehem, placed in a manger, Jesus would then live out 30 years of his life in relative obscurity. As he grew, he, he would take a blue collar job. This is like the show Undercover Boss on steroids. The Son of God is working a blue collar job. And then when it is time for his vocational ministry to start, Jesus then goes and gets baptized. Following that, he goes out in the wilderness to do battle with the devil. He's victorious, comes back and starts to assemble his ministry team. And guys, don't miss how funny this is, okay? So Jesus is assembling his ministry team, which would include white collar, blue collar. But not only that, he has a, a zealot on one side, which is basically a guy who wants to, to see the government dismantled. Another guy who's a tax collector who works for the government, this would be like showing up at your first ministry meeting and one guy walks in and he's wearing a Bernie Sanders feel the burn t-shirt and the next guy walks in wearing a Make America Great Again hat and you're like, this is going to be fun. This is going to be good. So Jesus brings all of these guys together and assembles them under the banner of a mission that supersedes any other mission that any of them have ever had prior. He unites them and invites them on an adventure that not only changed their lives, but changed and continues to change the world. And this is what God does because this is who God is. And if you were here last week, you heard us talk about Abraham and his adventurous faith. But I want to remind you that this isn't some niche topic in the scriptures. This isn't some random example. This is all throughout the scriptures. We see it with Abraham. 
We see it with Noah. We see it with the prophets and King David and Queen Esther. And we see it with all of the disciples. And we see it ultimately with Jesus. And we see it with the Apostle Paul. This idea that when God encounters people, he invites them on these significant adventures that changes lives and impacts the world. I, I might have missed the story in the scriptures where God shows up to give a guy a high five, watch a ball game, and eat some hot wings. But generally speaking, when God encounters people, he then invites them to participate with him on the mission that he already has. He invites them to follow Jesus. And I want you to see that the invitation to embrace adventurous faith all files in under one singular invitation. So I believe God's going to invite different people in this room to do different incredible things. And in some ways, what we do with our time and how we engage the mission is going to look very different from one another. But there is one primary invitation to which all of us must accept. It is the gateway through which all other invitations follow. And that is the invitation to follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. And when we say yes to that invitation, we are saying yes to becoming and being his disciples and also partnering with him to make disciples. And there is um, Danger might be too strong of a word, but there is this, there's this little bit of this danger in church culture where we hear words so often that we can almost forget what they mean. A disciple is a follower. A disciple is an apprentice. A disciple is someone who does what the master is doing. Francis Chan, in his book Multiply, discusses this subject. I want to share part of what he wrote with you. A disciple is a follower, but only if we take the term follower literally. Becoming a disciple of Jesus is as simple as obeying his call to follow. When Jesus called his first disciples, they may not have understood where Jesus would take them or the impact it would have on their lives, but they knew what it meant to follow. They took Jesus's call literally and began going everywhere he went and doing everything he did. It's impossible to be a disciple or a follower of someone and not end up like that person. Jesus said, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. That's the whole point of being a disciple. We imitate him, carry on his ministry, and become like him in the process. Yet somehow, Many have come to believe that a person can be a quote-unquote Christian without being like Christ. A quote-unquote follower who doesn't follow, how does that make any sense? Many people in the church have decided to take on the name of Christ and nothing else. This would be like Jesus walking up to those first disciples and saying, Hey, would you guys mind identifying yourselves with me in some way? Don't worry. I don't actually care if you do anything I do or change your lifestyle at all. I'm just looking for people who are willing to say they believe in me and call themselves Christians. Seriously? No one can really believe that this is all it means to be a Christian. But then why do so many people live this way? It appears that we've lost sight of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Those are tough words. The question that we have to wrestle with is, are those words true? I believe there are many people who self-identify as Christian, and that is sort of where it stops. Their identity as a Christian is merely this self-identification as a Christian, and they are not, nor are they intending to become more like Jesus. And so I, a question that I have for you, and it's a question that everyone in this room should wrestle with right now, myself included, leaders included, are you actually 
following Jesus? Are you actually following Jesus? Not just with your mouth, but with your life. Maybe you're here and you're like, well, what's a litmus test for that? How, how, do I, how do I answer this? I think it was Mark Driscoll who said it like this, and this might be helpful to you. He says, when you and Jesus disagree, which, time out, by the way, you will, okay? M Jesus and I have disagreed quite a bit. Jesus will want me to do something, and I'll be like, I'm not sure I want to do that. Jesus will want me to stop doing something. I want to continue doing that. Jesus wants me to think a certain way about a certain issue, and I'm like, that goes against my worldview. So the reality is, is that all of us disagree with Jesus all the time, right? For the most part. For most humans, that is the experience about every five minutes. The question is, is that for the follower of Jesus, when you and Jesus disagree— who wins the argument? When you and Jesus disagree, who wins the argument? For the follower of Jesus, Jesus should win the argument every time without exception. Now, I know this is hard. I don't like losing arguments. I'm assuming you don't like losing arguments. Even to Jesus, losing arguments is not fun. But here's what we need to remember. We need to remember who Jesus is, who we are losing arguments to. We're losing arguments to the Son of God who left heaven, took on flesh, came to earth on a rescue mission to save us from hell. He loves you more than you love yourself. He knows what is better for you than what you think to be best for yourself. He wants more for your life than you want for your life. And so here's a line I want you to lean into. Maybe take a picture of it. Maybe write it down. This is really important. It is a wonderful privilege for the follower of Jesus to lose arguments to Jesus. It is a wonderful privilege for the follower of Jesus to lose arguments to Jesus. This is a grace we have as people of God because he loves us more than we love ourselves. He knows what's best for us. I'm telling you, you don't want to win any arguments with Jesus. It does not go well for you. So if you're here, and maybe you're still on that initial argument with Jesus— the argument about surrendering your life to him, I want to encourage you to let today be your spiritual birthday. To not leave this place without confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead and experiencing salvation. Jesus died on the cross in your place for your sin. But ladies and gentlemen, he did not remain dead. He rose from the grave, triumphing over it, and offers you life eternal. He loves you, and he wants to enter into a relationship with you. And so if you're here and you're like, I have never given my life to Jesus, let today be the day. Maybe somebody brought you a friend that you could talk to about this. I'm going to be up here after service. I'd love to pray with you. I'd love to introduce you to Jesus. I'd love to talk with you about next steps. Do not let this moment pass you by. But for those of us who already have a relationship with Jesus, the question I, I want you to wrestle with today is do you need to recapture what it means to follow him? I'm not talking about your salvation. I'm talking about you living it out. Do you need to recapture what it means to follow Jesus? Perhaps as I was talking about ongoing arguments, maybe there's something that the Spirit of God is just bringing to the forefront of your mind. And before you leave this room today, there's an argument you need to concede with Jesus. Perhaps this afternoon, you need to carve out some time and get alone with your Savior and just ask him, invite him into the conversation, Lord, am I following you? Lord, would you give me grace and courage to follow you, strength to follow you? Would you forgive me for the times I haven't followed well? He loves you. 
he'd want to have that conversation with you. But Edgewater Alliance Church, we have the opportunity for incredible adventure. The adventure of following this Jesus, this Jesus who gave everything for you, who loves you, who's always with you, and he's inviting you to follow him. That is an adventure I do not want to miss out on. That is an adventure I do not want us to miss out on. So Edgewater Alliance Church, may we embrace adventurous faith as we follow, truly follow Jesus. God bless you guys. Go be the church.